You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is the esteemed, incredibly well-liked, and the absolutely uh, living legend-esque, as decided by the Indiana Historical Society, Judge Sarah Evans Barker. Thank you, Your Honor, for coming on. Can we end this interview right now? You're the judge. (laughs) We are joined today by Danielle Shockey, CEO of Girl Scouts of Central Indiana. And like all times when Danielle's here, she is in charge. Oh, Danielle, go right ahead. I don't know about that. I uh, I appreciate it. The judge is in charge if Spangle says it's okay. Okay. All right. So we'll start, um, Judge, if you don't mind, for our listeners who may not um, be as familiar with your story, um, tell tell the world in the in the listening universe your your background, where you grew up, what led you to this role, where you were before this, and just a little bit about what your current role is. I don't know that everybody understands the role you currently play for our state and for the country. So, well, that's a pretty all inclusive it is question. Uh, and at this point in my career, as uh, I'm sort of winding down now as a senior judge, uh, if, for me to recap the entire journey uh, may take your entire podcast time a lot. So I'll try to tell it in an interesting and succinct way. Thank you. The, um, I grew up in Mishawaka. Uh, I was the second of six kids in my family. Uh, we were a very close family. We grew up on the outskirts of Mishawaka, actually. Uh, my parents were one of those first couples who decided to move everybody out of the town of Mishawaka, the city of Mishawaka, to uh, a, a more rural area to have space so that we could roam and run and have animals and so forth. And so we did, but we were one of the first families that did it. It was regarded as uh, adventuresome, I think, by most of uh, my parents' friends. But we drew on the city. I went to Mishawaka High School. Uh, My husband, Ken, was a classmate. Uh, We ran in the same pack of friends. We stayed friends. So when we finally got married, which was after law school and after law school for both of us, and after we had started our respective career paths um, and we decided to get married, it was really a case of good friends getting married because we had known each other so long. Um, the uh, family I grew up in was, uh, as I said, large. It was a happy family. It was a deeply principled family, values-centered family. Um, they All the, the kids are grandparents now. So we've lost one sister, but everybody else is, uh, has moved along in age uh, and through their own careers and, and very productive and um, lovely ways, really, education, religion, law, etc. I, um, I went to Indiana University for undergraduate uh, school. I was sort of a cork on the ocean. It was hard for me to find a major Turns out, you know, you know things looking back that you didn't know at the time, uh, couldn't have perceived, but that's probably one of the best qualifications to be a federal district court judge, which is my current uh, post and has been for 35 years now. Uh, Because we say about being a district court judge, a federal district court judge, that it's the last bastion for generalists. In the law, you have to be able to handle all of the matters that come into federal court, and they are hugely uh, diverse and varied and challenging. So, when I was at Indiana University trying to figure out, even on a major, what I should do, and it was so not clear what I should do, um, that turned out to be sort of a sign, a window into what kind of work eventually would be so satisfying to me because I've always said about myself, I have a low boredom threshold. And so I have to keep the pot churning. I have to keep things interesting uh, coming and 
uh, into my life. Um, and even though being a judge may look like it's sort of boring to a lot of people, uh, I'll, I'll just add a little footnote about that. Sometimes I get asked by a young woman especially, but students, if they can come shadow me on those days when they have off and they're supposed to go shadow somebody who is a figure in the community and so forth. Unless I have something going on in the courtroom, which I don't every day, uh, it would be a very boring thing for them to shadow me because they would watch me at the computer. They'd watch me trying to work writing and thinking and working through problems, which is, of course, uh, completely internal. So I have to tell them that, that if there's not something happening in the arena. So it looks boring to people, but it's really wonderfully lively. So anyway, I did finally determine a major at Indiana University. I was very happy at Indiana University. And uh, after that, I needed to work for a year uh, to uh, get a little bit of money together because I've told you now I, I was the second of six kids. And so others had to draw down on the family a uh, pot of money for school. And so I worked for a year at the University of Rhode Island uh, as a guidance counselor, dorm counselor person, and then started law school at William & Mary in Virginia, Colonial Williamsburg uh, area, and then uh, transferred up to American University in Washington because I could get a job while I went to law school. So um, I had assistance from my folks. Uh, it was at a time when you could piece together the financial wherewithal to support your education. I don't think that can happen anymore. It didn't happen with our own children. It took many more um, uh, dollars and much more focus uh, and more contributors to the pot um, when our kids were in school. But then a part-time job and a little bit, a bit of help from your folks, and you could you could manage it. I think the tuition for living in a dorm, I didn't join a sorority uh, during those years. That would have been another expense that I just passed by. But uh, living in the dorm, I think, if I'm remembering right, room and board was about $97 a month. So I could manage that. And I got a part-time job uh, in law school for the same reason and uh, finished at American University. Uh, I had an opportunity uh, my last semester to work as a legislative assistant for a congressman uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, so I, that last semester of law school, I was also working full time on the Hill. But I had enough hours that I could finish uh, on time. Uh, that started my, my legal career uh, as a legislative assistant. After about nine months, I had an opportunity to move over to the Senate side, and I worked for Senator Charles Percy from Illinois, one of my heroes. Um, I worked there through uh, 1972. He had a re-election campaign in Chicago and, well, all of Illinois, but we lived in Chicago, uh, to manage that campaign in 72. Ken and I had become engaged in 1972, Ken had gone off to law school, and then it was during the Vietnam War. So he was in the service, as many young men were. Um, luckily for him, and he says so too, uh, he did not have to go to Vietnam. He served in Germany. And he was a lawyer by then. He had gone to Harvard. And uh, so he, he was used in Germany first as a captain, uh, doing administrative tasks, and then they needed all the lawyers to serve as lawyers, so he lawyered uh, as part of his military obligation. So he had come back, and he was practicing here in Indianapolis. I was working on the Hill. As I said, we always had stayed in touch with each other. And um, I worked on Senator Percy's campaign in 72, and I told Ken when we agreed to get married that he'd have to wait until after the campaign. So he's been a patient man all these years to sort of merge his life and, and pace into my career life and pace. He's a wonderful companion. So we got married at the end of 1972, and I came here uh, to Indianapolis. It was the Whither Thou Goest Syndrome, but it worked out fine. Uh, and uh, I was able to uh, know that there was a job opening that I could apply for 
in the United States Attorney's Office. Now, I wouldn't want anybody to think that the skids were greased. It was not a political fix. But I did learn, because I was sort of in the know about government things and government developments, uh, that there there was an opening on this staff. So I applied. Uh, I was given an interview, and I was hired. Um, and Ken was practicing here, so the object was for me to find a job here. The uh, thing I didn't know when I applied, and even when I got the job, uh, I learned on the first day that I came here to this courthouse uh, to be sworn in, which was right after our honeymoon. It was between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I had said to the United States Attorney, Stanley Miller, well, I'll, I'll come in in January, because all my stuff was in boxes and, you know, we just moved into our house. I needed to have a little time. I had to write thank you notes for all those wedding presents because we got married the end of November. And he says, no, no, come in. Come in now. You might want to bring your husband, he said. And I thought, well, okay. You know, having a husband was sort of new, so I didn't know if that was how it happened. You take your husband to sign in for a job, but okay. Happily, I had worn a dress. We all wore dresses and skirts. That was the professional attire. Even more that day, I had worn pearls, which proved to be prescient because it turned into a full-blown press conference. And I didn't anticipate that. I had not been told that. I didn't even exactly know why. But when I got there, I was informed I was the first woman who had been appointed uh, as an assistant U.S. attorney. So happily, because I had hung around Washington, I was on to the way you do a press conference. And so I wasn't totally intimidated by that. And it turned out to be, we used to have two newspapers then, the Star in the morning and the News in the afternoon. And my picture, taking the oath, hand right hand raised, etc., pearls on display, was the above-the-fold picture on the front page of the news that afternoon. So all of that, I suppose it's just a good thing I didn't know. I might have been anxious about it or nervous, but it sort of unfolded before my very eyes, and I had to respond and react and pretend like it was nothing new. I do remember one of the questions I was asked by one of the reporters, how does it feel to be the first woman appointed as an assistant U.S. attorney? And just... I'll insert, the the U.S. attorney is the prosecutor. It's the trial officer of the Department of Justice in a particular district. So I was going to be trying cases uh, in our courts before our judges. Um, And so anyway, she says, how does it feel to be the first woman? I said, well, I don't know. I never tried it as a man. (laughs) So That's perfect. I was able to come up with a, a little glib response. But that meant then that... Uh, People wanted to see, how does this woman do this? And I felt the pressure to do it well so that um, I didn't disappoint Stanley Miller, for one thing, and that I was worthy of the office, which is a very important office as a federal prosecutor, and that I knew I was holding the door open for other women. And I wanted to do that um, in a way that would not impede their journeys. So... Did you ever feel that way through school, through law school? Did you feel like I'm walking into a space where right now my classes are full of men and I'm one of few women? Did you feel that until that moment? Oh, yes. I was a decided minority. You've heard the stories about Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Their stories are uh, much more widely told and people are much more familiar with them. They should be. Uh, But all of us of that era, because I graduated in 1969, um, it lived with the disparity in numbers in our classes. When I started at William & Mary, there were 60 women, I mean, sorry, 60 students, three women. When I moved up to American University, there were 150 students in my class, 10 women. So still quite a minority. And there were some ways in which there was hazing. I always remember and sometimes tell the story about the uh, evidence class my first year, and, you know, your first year of law school, you're just absolutely, it's like you've been thrown into deep water. You're swimming hard, and you're not sure what direction you're headed. And if you've got the stuff, 
you know, there's there's nothing that's reassuring about it. It's all sort of uh, challenging and intimidating and worrisome to law students. Uh, but we had uh, in the evidence class an old, crusty former prosecutor. Now I know about prosecutors, and I know some of them can be crusty, but <laughs> I don't think I am anymore. Uh, but he was, and we had been alerted, we women, the three of us, that uh, when it came to the classes, uh, the discussion uh, in evidence of the rape cases, actually this was criminal law, I misspoke, not evidence, but criminal law, um, when it came to the chapter on rape cases that this prosecutor, as an additional test, would put all the questions out to the women. And we, it, I don't know if anybody has uh, remembers or uh, can call to mind Paper Chase, the movie about the Harvard Law School experience and so forth. It was a lot like that. It was a lot of hazing. And this was one rather minor form of it, but for us it was intimidating. There was not the, the ease of discussion of issues like this in those days. And so we were alerted that we would be called upon to recite on those cases. And you always stood to recite, called by your last name, Miss Evans. And you hoped that you had the, 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 the right answer, but also the sort of emotional stamina not to embarrass yourself or stand out in some way. So I won't tell your, your listeners about the specific questions, but they were about that case. And we had to talk in sort of clim clinical detached ways about the essential elements of that offense and so forth. So I remember practicing before I went to class to be able to say out loud what the answers might be to that question about the essential elements of the offense of rape. So there was that sort of thing, but it, it was it was a hard career because we felt our minority status. Um, then when I got ready to, to graduate, I was so lucky that I just happened on to this uh, associate dean, uh, Anthony Morella, who matched me up with the opportunity to work on the Hill. And I'd gone up to see him, not knowing exactly what I, why I made the appointment or what we were going to talk about. Um, and he broached the subject, would you like to work on the Hill? I said, oh, yes, <laughs> wouldn't I? So it's one of the advantages of going to school in Washington. Uh, so that's how that door got opened. It was pretty fortuitous uh, that I just happened to be there at the time he had uh, been contacted about somebody who could serve as a legislative assistant. Uh, but... The women in my class, those 10 women, had a lot of trouble finding jobs. The person who graduated first in our class was a woman, and she could not find a job. She couldn't get interviews at law firms. Uh, she wound up, I learned later, she, she was a little older um, as a law student. She had had her family and so forth. She, boy, she was a crackerjack lawyer, though. She, was, she set the, the bar for all of us. And she couldn't get interviews. And so you could say, well, it was age, or you could say whatever you want to say. It surely wasn't a lack of smarts, and it had to be a big dollop of gender, because that's what happened then. And uh, I, I learned later, sadly through an obituary that I read in our alumni magazine, that she had worked all her career at the Department of Labor. So, see, the government would hire women, and the pay structure was pretty even. There wasn't a distinction made by, by gender. So in any event, finished law school, worked on the Hill, came to Indianapolis, as I've already recounted, worked as an assistant United States attorney, and then became the first assistant, which meant the chief staff person. Uh, then President Carter was elected, uh, and the U.S. attorney that for whom I had worked was appointed by Nixon. So uh, the politics changed in the office then. It doesn't, th the top person changes still, but not down the line. So the U.S. attorney and I both left to make room for the new U.S. attorney when Carter became president. And I was in pr private practice here at the Bose McKinney and Evans Law Firm, a, a wonderful place. Very fine people who taught me how to practice law in that setting. 
uh, and gave me uh, many opportunities and lots of camaraderie, which was nice. But again, I was I was the only woman coming through the ranks. Then there was another woman, pretty quickly hired, but we were um, we were few in number. Then Reagan. President Reagan was elected, and uh, Senator Luger, who was really more important in my career than President Reagan, although pr- the president makes the appointments. Uh, but Senator Luger selected me to be the United States attorney to come back as the top spot, which is where I was when Judge Holder, my predecessor here in this uh, in this seat on this court, uh, died suddenly over Labor Day. He had a stroke. Uh, I was the U.S. attorney, which is, um, I never thought about being a judge. I didn't lay out my career with that sort of focus. I, I never quite knew where I would go next. It wasn't that sort of uh, arrangement. And uh, so there I was, though, in a very good position. Uh, quite interestingly, um, and I hope this story is always told with respect to my career because it's it's really key. Uh, in the summer before Judge Holder died in September, Senator Luger had made a speech to the Republican National Committee. They were getting ready for another election. Uh, they were um, putting together a platform and so forth. And he made a very uh, important speech in a prominent place, and it showed up as an op-ed piece in the New York Times and uh, the Wall Street Journal. And Senator Luger was saying to his Republican Party colleagues, we have to appoint women, and we have to appoint them to high government positions in meaningful ways. So he had staked out that position in the summer, and then Judge Holder died. And so when the spot opened... Um, in a way you could say it was a way of seeing if Senator Luger really meant that uh, because the process distilled down to three people, three of us who were candidates for the the judgeship. And uh, I mentioned the other two because both have been dear friends. They were, I didn't know one of them at the time, but have become dear friends. One was Randy Shepard, who became our Indiana Chief Justice and served with such distinction, such um, uh, real skill and wisdom uh, for many years. He's retired now. And Judge Sue Shields, who was on the Indiana Court of Appeals and was Indiana's first elected trial judge. She had a wonderful reputation. So I was selected. I think maybe if there was a reason for me that made me different than the others, it was that I had been in the federal system. I surely was not a better lawyer or better uh, qualified uh, than the other two. They just are extraordinary lawyers and judges. But I had been in the federal system. So Judge or Senator Luger had a chance to uh, follow through on his position, and he did. He, he in in. Uh, he appointed me, he asked me if I would, I would do that. I was so honored. So that was um, 1984. That's when my judicial career started. And that's where I've been for 35 years. And during that time, I've had, uh, I had a seven-year stint as chief judge. Uh, I was the first woman appointed to the federal court uh, in Indiana. And I stayed the only woman on the federal courts for a long time. It wasn't until my colleague and friend up in Fort Wayne um, uh, was appointed a woman um, that uh, there was a second woman. So it took a a long time to get another woman on the court, but uh, now, you know, on our court, there are three women, uh, two in active status. I'm on senior status. So... That is a very long question to a pretty or answer to a pretty short question. I hope I didn't overdo. Not at all. Thank you so much. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood 
Caterpillar dealer. So this is an important question for those of us who are not attorneys. Okay. How many episodes of Law and Order do I have to watch before I am qualified to appear before your bench? Well, that won't get you very far down the road. It won't make me a lawyer? No. It'll probably give you some bad habits I'll have to try to wring out of you if you wind up over here. Do you have... You know, a lot of people think that the only service a lawyer provides, especially a trial lawyer, is to stand up and talk. And they overlook the benefits of that education and that experience and that skill, and sometimes just pure chutzpah that allows them to stand up and represent to the judge uh, a credible argument. Do any TV shows get it right that well, they, deal with the courts and the legal system? Uh, you're asking sort of the wrong person because for me to watch these is a bus month's holiday, <laughs> which I usually don't do. Uh, the best ones are on public broadcasting. Uh, I have to say they're the ones that try to be uh, authoritative and accurate. Uh, the others are drama. And so sometimes, in fact, we have to instruct our juries not to expect too much of the lawyers, to not expect <laughs> that this is all going to be resolved in 47 minutes yeah. with intermissions and so forth. You know, the uh, prosecutors in particular are very uh, sensitive to the fact that people expect a CSI sort of solution to every case that's brought. Like a slam dunk smoking gun on everything. Right. So it makes the decision. And science mm -hmm. that compels uh, a specific result. And most of the cases are much more uh, ambiguous than that. And besides, we have our rules of law, the presumption of innocence and so forth. So a little bit of evidence won't do the trick. You've got to convince the jury beyond a reasonable doubt that the person's guilty as charged. Has any movie gotten it right? Did you ever do you go to those movies or do you avoid them because you can't watch them as Sarah? You watch them as Judge Barker. Hmm. Well, I, I, can't, I have to answer that obliquely by saying that I did this season go to the wonderful production of 12 Angry Men. At the IRT. At, at IRT. Great movie, by yeah. the way. And in fact, one of the reasons, I mean, we have season tickets, so that was why we went. But uh, I was tapped by my friend, uh, Ms. Allen, to uh, give a 20-minute, uh, 25-minute uh, chat with the audience afterwards about what it's like for people to serve on a jury and what it's like to wait for those verdicts and uh, to be drawn into the process. What I know about jury service, even though I'm outside the door when they're uh, deliberating. So Janet Allen knew that. We need to have her on the podcast. She's yeah, so great. She is great. So and great. She knew that when she called up her friend Sarah, that her, her friend Sarah would likely do what she wanted her to do. Is it is it hard not to be a judge in every situation? Oh, yes. Like, it's, no, it's not hard. At home, at the and grocery guess, store when you're driving? Yeah. Do you want to get out of your car and say, When our you're kids were little, now keep Use in mind. Use your turn signal. Keep in mind, our kids all now have kids, so we're happy grandparents. But when our kids were little, I used to say that I'd sometimes mix up the discipline and I'd want to put the lawyers in the corner and fine my children. <laughs> uh, so, oh, no, it's very easy to be uh, out of the role. And the children won't let you be judge. I mean, they're... They'll say, I'm not in your courtroom, Mom. Yeah, I mean, they didn't even need to. Um, they are just pure kids. And there are lots of places. You know, we're active in our little community. We live outside of Morgantown, and we go to uh, our church there, and we're part of that community. We have many close friends. Um, the uh, Sometimes, you know, somebody will say, uh, you know, how shall I refer to you. And I, I always give them permission to go informal and casual, but I have to say, but if you come to court, you better <laughs> observe the forms, observe the forms. But it's a, you're, in a, you're in a leadership position, which puts you outside of the court in a natural leadership, comfortable leadership situation. People would look to you to be the leader. As, are there times where you're like, I do this Monday through Friday for 70 hours a week. Let someone else be in charge. 
do you want that relaxation and you're not? Well, my husband would say that I relinquish control very reluctantly. So let somebody else be in charge or not words that come tripping off my lips very often. Uh, But sure, you know, there are times when uh, I live in some fear that when I'm gardening, for instance, that somebody will stop by who doesn't have a wide tolerance for uh, straw hats, let's say, uh, and dirty fingernails. So, yes, of course, you know, you, you are who you are, but you don't role play all the time. Now, there's a wonderful story that I always think of about this because people are very polite and they're very deferential. Uh, And even good friends um, stay within bounds. Good friends, for example, don't ask about my decisions. They don't ask why I would decide in a particular way. And many of the cases we rule on are very controversial. We know that people have differing views. We know that uh, they send out the decisions, send out ripples and affect people's lives. That's the role of the court. That's the power of a judge. But even... Good friends don't say that. And I can say after 47 years of marriage that Ken Barker has never said, what the hell were you thinking? (laughs) About your decisions. About my decisions, yes. Other things. Other things, oh yes, (laughs) those words would creep in. But the story I was going to tell you, because I think it's such a poignant story, that uh, after Prince Albert died, who was Queen Victoria's much beloved husband, and they had a long, long marriage, she said, um, she says, now the only person who called me by my name is gone. Mm-hmm. So it's something to give up your name and go by a title. It is an adjustment. And you get more at home with that. So it's true. You know, when I go out to eat lunch, like I was today with these friends I told you about, um, I know them both well. They both call me judge. So it, it's part of who you are. I've never called Greg Ballard anything other than mayor or colonel. Well, I've never called him by his first name I ever. I never called Senator Luger Dick, I'll tell you that. Um, I yeah. asked Al Hubbard that question once. Al Hubbard, who is an Indianapolis guy who we, most people know, he went to Harvard Business School with George Bush, George W. Bush. And I said, when was the last time you called him George? He said, Election Day, 2000. Mm -hmm. I've never called him that since then. Yeah. They deserve that title. You deserve that title, that distinction, that respect. Mm -hmm. But does it become a bit of a straitjacket? Have you ever thought about leaving and just doing something else and letting someone else have all that's the responsibility that comes with this important job? No, I, I, I am on senior status now. I'm staying after I was eligible to leave because the work is deeply satisfying and rewarding. It extends your reach in terms of what you can do and uh, whose um, lives you can influence. Uh, There are hard parts to it, of course, and there there are a lot of um, parts of it that weigh heavy, but you learn sort of to let each day uh, be uh, a sufficient, uh, carry a sufficient weight, and then you let it go so you can do the next day. So one of my friends said when I first became a judge, don't worry about the decisions you've made. There are always so many more ahead. That's why we have a court of appeals. You give, you make your best judgment at the time, and then you let it go. So you only have part, as as much responsibility as a judge has, a judge only has a small part of the responsibility for what has to happen when a person gets drawn into the the judicial system. So I'll, I'll, we do civil cases and criminal cases, but I'll speak of the criminal ones because it's easier, I think, for people to understand that um, it's not my fault that somebody's standing before me uh, either having been found guilty or pleading guilty and having to be sentenced. I didn't ask for the... Uh, the responsibility to decide their case in particular, but it is my role to decide that. But so many other factors have uh, been in play that have brought people before the court. And I have many defendants who say, um, this is nobody's fault but my own, my own bad decision-making, my own failure to learn from the past, 
my own addictions, my own disabilities, my own uh, narrow-mindedness and selfishness. Almost every defendant I've ever had appear before me in all of these years regrets the impact of what they've done on their children. Mm-hmm. Even when the relationship with the children is so attenuated and you think, really? How can I be sure you really care that much about the children? Oh, no. In their own ways, often flawed ways, those children matter to them. And they, they want me to know that. They, think, they take that as a sign that they're not all bad, that there's still something redeemable about them, that they're a good dad or they try to be a good dad. Is mercy a necessary part of being a judge, oh, of yeah. sentencing people? Yes, there's always room for mercy. The law requires you to do things. It sets boundaries on what you can do. It gives, it, it, uh, gives context to your discretion, and you have to operate within the legal system. So it's not just Barker feeling sorry for somebody. It's Judge Barker's effort to weave the various components of discretion into a particular decision. And mercy's part of it. Judgment's part of it. Punishment's part of it. Uh, deterrence is part of it. Vindicating the, the rule of law is part of it. So there are a lot of factors that have to be woven into the fabric of a particular case and all the decisions that have to be made in that context. So you don't come in and say, I'm going to let this guy off. That'd be all mercy. No, you have to say, what does the totality of the circumstance require for it to be a just result? And too much of anything would throw it out of kilter. If I were too harsh, it would throw it out of kilter. You mentioned earlier about being U.S. attorney yes. for the Southern District. I'm going to give you three names, all of whom you know, all of all of whom have I think made a pretty good life of themselves. Uh, the first one is Deborah Daniels, and the second one is Susan Brooks, and the third one is Joe Hogsett. What was it like to work with them? I guess we can talk about Tim Morrison as well, but he's probably not as well known. But those three have gone on to fabulous careers, both in the private and public sector and in the community. Are you proud of them? Oh, you bet. And uh, they're all dear friends. And I mean, that's not just a figure of speech. Uh, We're on each other's speed dials. uh, And we stay in touch. And so when something comes along that prompts a communication... Uh, we're back and and forth with each other. We always observed the boundaries. We each had roles to play. And everybody knew that. But within those boundaries, we had huge respect and affection for each other. So uh, Susan Brooks and I like to tell the story that uh, I had just been appointed to the court here um, and was tapped to give the commencement speech to the law school uh, graduates at the Indianapolis uh, Law School, now the McKinney Law School. And she was in that class. So I don't remember the exact year. I was appointed in 84, so it might have been 85. I mean, it was very soon. And uh, she was in the class, and she was the student speaker. (laughs) And, well, who knew? (laughs) Who knew it would all unfold? So, you know, she had uh, many... Uh, important responsibilities as a deputy mayor. She started out, though, as a defense lawyer. And she tried cases before me as a defense lawyer. Uh, She was with Rick Kamen. Uh, Rick was senior to her, so he was her mentor. And she, but she came over many times and tried cases. Uh, And at each step of the way, she would find her way over here and say, I'm thinking about this, thinking about that. So I, I, I would say I've been a mentor mostly because I'm older uh, and a little bit farther down the path than she is. But more than that, we've been collaborators and friends, and she would confide in me uh, her career interests and goals. Um, I'm very fond of her. Deborah Daniels is also just a dear friend. I imagine her brother was probably in the room as they were... Well, he was working for Luger. Exactly. Back during those years. It is true. I met her through Mitch. Um, But we are friends in our own right. We're in a a group called Girls' Night Out, 
we've uh, we've sort of broadened the definition of girls <laughs> to include all of us, but we're in that august group, and it's fun, and I see her. She just sent me a text message over the weekend because she was fundraising. I hate for this to get out, but she, she has a special interest in a special uh, not-for-profit, and she sent out uh, an email to a group of friends. I was a recipient, said, if you're making these kinds of contributions, I'd appreciate your thinking about this one. So I, I didn't send much money, but I sent a little bit. Uh, and so it it tells you what I want to tell you, that she included me in her her list. She wouldn't include me in her list if she expected to make a lot of money on <laughs> on that solicitation. But you know, she would be a terrific guest. You know, she's done so much. And the the first real mention we had of her, because her, her, her brother, Mitch Daniels, has been on the podcast, as has Susan Brooks, was when Mark Miles told the story of how he got involved in politics. He said, I asked my friend Debbie, hey, I want to get involved in politics. And she says, well, call my mo- my brother Mitch. He's running the uh, Luger campaign against Bai in 74. People don't realize how much she's done and kind of the diverse oh, yeah. career she's had. Yeah. Well, and not just for her brother. I mean, she's had a wonderful career. In her own right. Absolutely. Right. After she finished being U.S. attorney, she had an important position at the Department of Justice. Um, and I bought Joe Hogg said, well, you know, he was over here all the time for when he was U.S. attorney about one thing or another. That's what U.S. attorneys do. They confer not about specific cases, but about how's my staff doing, you know, what do we need to know to do it better, et cetera. And um, we had wide ranging chats. I don't know if you know that our mayor uh, has a degree from Christian Theological Seminary. And that master's y- degree in history. Yeah. And he is wonderfully well read, but also very thoughtful, deeply thoughtful. So that would always give rise to some sort of side conversation about something or another uh, that made it a, a very engaging uh, conversation when he would come. We'd start out talking about business and then we'd talk about books we've read. Uh, but, I, you know, I don't live in Indianapolis, I'm not a constituent. But I did send him a text of congratulations after he won, which I thought was okay. It was not so partisan. It was only because of our friendship. Uh, Kindness is always welcome. Uh, I hope so. Yeah, That's how it was intended. So you mentioned Girls' Night Out. Yes. Those are important. Yeah. And so I want you to tell the story a little bit about the gathering, as it's now, I guess, named, and yeah. kind of the start. And, and really more than that, what is the importance in your career and what advice would you give to other women for finding that group of friends who can lift you up and, and, and again, not have an agenda. Like, and see you through. Yeah. yeah. So talk about just kind of that part of your world and, and, and what hope, what you've given to other women because of that goal that you've had. Oh, well, what I've given, I'll, that'll be harder to answer than the question, what have I gotten from it? Because I've gotten a lot. I, the impetus for my involvement in uh, women's gatherings, I'll use it with a lowercase g, um, to start out, uh, was because, as I said, there were so few women. I was the only one on the U.S. Attorney's staff. I didn't know anybody in town when I came except my husband. I did have one old friend from IU who was here but wasn't available for that kind of socializing. So I really did have to start from scratch. And as I was... Um, getting involved in bar association activities and so forth, uh, it it became clear to me that there were other women, women lawyers, uh, a few women judges, not very many, um, of whom I, uh, people were speaking highly and um, and in very kind ways that made me think I would like to know them. And so it started out with a group of four of us that would get together, uh, all lawyers. Um, and I can tell you who they were. There was, it was Sue Shields and Martha Lampkin and a woman who was on the IU Bloomington faculty, Eileen Nagel, and me. We we're all lawyers. Our paths had crossed. We came to know each other. And um, we started doing periodic lunches uh, at the old King Cole. Uh, we had to sort of take a deep breath to pay the tab for a lunch at King Cole because we were all raising children, too. (laughs) And there's no other place to go. No, there was not any other place, and it was right downtown. And that was a life support group. 
And the four of us came to to perceive that there were other little groups like this around uh, that were getting together and enjoying each other's camaraderie and uh, the relationships and so forth. So we, we started merging some groups every once in a while. So we decided we should do this in a big way, and we put together what we, we first referred to as the uh, Indiana Leadership Celebration. And our guest list was all the women we could think of in Indiana who held some sort of leadership position, lawyers, doctors, professors, legislators, um, everything, whoever we could think of who was moving at sort of a professional level, we would get together so we could all be together and see that actually there was a critical mass of women in Indiana because we had to sort of remind each other of that. So many of us were off on our own individual solitary toots that you'd lose sight of it. And so uh, the first dinner we had like that was right, it, it, we staged it, it was coincidental, right before I was sworn in as a judge. So I remember 1984. And we had invited Susan Stamberg from NPR, uh, all things considered, to come out and speak. And she did. Oh, she was wonderful. And we had a dinner at one of the hotels. And uh, it was just, a, as the old cliche goes, a great time was had by all. <laughs> and we decided this works. And so then we put together two or three more of those. Uh, but to get that number of people together was challenging. All of us had our day jobs. And the number of women was increasing. So it turned out to be logistically more challenging. We had one um, gathering of that sort. It was the Indian Leadership Celebration uh, Group. Uh, we had a, our own uh, sold-out play at IRT, uh, of a one-woman show just for our group. Of course, Janet Allen was part of our planning, but we bought out the house, and it was all the women, and we had dinner before that at one of the hotels. So we found really fun things to do like that that were bonding and reinforcing and so forth. But soon it became too challenging to have something uh, of that uh, scope in that stature. So we we reshaped it into the group that's now called the gathering. And um it's the st the composition is still basically the same. It's Indiana women leaders. Uh we've had to cap the number just for purposes of management. We meet four times a year. Uh, the interesting thing is that we don't have any mission statement. We don't have any overarching noble purposes. It's simply to get together and be together. So we agree that we won't ask each other to fundraise. All the rest of us have our own interests in that regard, our own activities. Um, we don't give out the mailing list because that's not what it's about. It's about our getting together. And the number, I think I'm right about this, the number is capped at about 200. We usually get, we usually meet at the skyline. We usually get about 75 or 80 because people have such busy schedules. The, um, we have meetings four times a year. There's an executive committee that meets in my jury room, uh, often enough to keep things rolling. Uh, the annual cost of membership is $35 which we use to pay somebody to manage the mailing list, make our reservations, keep track of who's coming to lunch and order the menu and so forth. So it's no money at all, really. And she does all the work for us. We come up with the program ideas. And we've had just a rich array of speakers and presenters. We just had a wonderful a uh, professor from Butler who does a, a program on women's suffrage since we're into the 100th anniversary of that. Um, we had the, the woman who's the number two person at the airport tell us why we have the top airport in the country. And we're getting these international direct flights uh, and why it is an award-winning airport. Uh, we had the the woman who's heading up the um, the. 100th celebration for, oh, I, I'm doing a brain fade here. The the um, over on Indiana Avenue, the the woman African American entrepreneur, Madam, Madam, Madam G. Walker. Walker, Madam Walker. Sorry, sign of old age. 
brain fade. But she's heading up the restoration of the building and the 100th celebration with her board. It's wonderfully impressive. So excited about what's in in store for that. Uh, and reminding us of what a rich heritage uh, Madam Walker uh brought to our community and and is worthy of continued celebration. So those are, you know, those are women that we have the, you know, Lieutenant Governor and we have the Chief Justice of Indiana and anybody else we can corral. So they're wonderfully, um, they charge our batteries. Mm-hmm. It's always fun. The, the real challenge we say about each program is getting everybody to stop the initial chatter to hear the mm-hmm. announcements because everybody's glad to see them. Don't you have a gavel? I don't take that. <laughs> Can't you gavel a, these people? I need a bailiff. That's what I need. A bailiff. A Go fork in there. And, a fork and a water glass. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you say? So I, I just can't help but think what you described in your law classes is not much different now in other career types. STEM careers, for example. Girl Scouts. We talk to little girls all the time who or high school girls. They're one of a few in their AP chemistry class. Or they know that's going to be a challenge in their career that there's so few women. Um, Or that it'll take 107 years for the number of women serving in politics Mm -hmm. to actually become equal to the number of men if we at the current rate. What would you what what do you say to young girls um, about their future and opportunities because of what you've lived through? Well, you have to follow your natural interests. Uh, That is, if you want to be happy. Uh, they won't all make you wealthy, uh, but you have to, there has to be some sort of internal resonance, something that reinforces your choice in a deeply internal way that it makes you feel like what you're doing is your highest and best use and that you can make a difference in your own life and the lives of, uh, of others, whatever it is that gives you a sense of meaning about life. So you have to first listen to yourself and then have enough courage to follow uh, that insight and that knowledge. Uh, STEM and uh, STEM subjects and organic chemistry and organic uh, anything. Uh, take any hard science. Um, it's hard not because you're a woman and it's hard for a woman. It's hard. It's challenging. And so any subject that calls forth the best in you, that makes you want to accept those challenges and master the subject, is likely to give you the sense that uh, you're doing something that matters. And that is important. You only get one time down the road. I always say to people who come in and tell me that they'd like to be a judge someday or they, how do I get onto a career path? You know, whenever I get enlisted for mentoring, uh, there are no straight roads, only looking back. And so all of the things I've just told you in this broadcast about my own career, th- those things unfolded. That is organic, to use the word. That is a process that you discover and you reinforce and, um, and you develop as you go. But it's not a matter of putting tin cans on fence posts and picking them off one at a time in a linear sort of fashion. Um, So there's only a straight line looking back, and you have to have enough uh, uh, spunk, enough self-confidence, enough courage to go in the direction that you sense is going to give you a meaningful, happy life. Um, But all of these decisions come with consequences. So I always say, look, whoever you're going to partner up with has to be as interested in your goals as you are interested in the other person's goals. Because you have to come at these things as a team, especially if you have children, that you, these are decisions that have to be made in a group way. Even when you know that you have in you this impulse to climb the ladder or to succeed, um, you can do it on your own. It's just a lot harder. So, You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley Golden Ace Inn, 
and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We're getting let me, close. Let me, Go ahead. Let me tell you one thing about that uh, uh, train station over there, Union Station, that you've mentioned in your your uh, recap of sponsors of this program. Uh, sh- shortly after Bob and Sandra Bournes oh, had yeah. uh-huh. overseen the restoration of it, and our whole community was so proud of it. It was just... Uh, it's just a show place. Uh, I held a naturalization ceremony in the Great Hall over there uh, to welcome some new citizens uh, into our national family uh, as a way of celebrating the opening of that place uh, so that it would be a place that they could claim in two different ways as part of the community and also um, as new citizens. So I, whenever I think about Union Station. Whenever I drive by there, I always remember that time. It was it was a wonderful day. The acoustics were terrible, <laughs> but we managed to get a hundred new citizens uh, ensconced. There's there's very few plaques in the Union Station uh, area, but one of them that most people don't see, which which makes my history nerdetry uh, peak the meter, is the fact that Arthur Conan Doyle. The author of the Sherlock Holmes books has a plaque dedicated that he came through Indianapolis really? way back when. What are the odds? You mentioned as we wind up here, and then we'll close with the five questions that Danielle will ask you. Okay. Are, these, may- are these the stump the guest questions? These are the yes. speed rounds. All, okay. the speed all rounds. 12th century English oh, history yeah, questions. Oh, yeah. I was hoping you'd ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned IU before. Yeah. And there's a terrific group of leaders from Indianapolis and Indiana, not that Purdue didn't have some, Dina Potter from the Girl Scouts, Central Indiana, who's sitting here giving me the Boilermaker stink eye. But we had Jim Kittle, Randy Tobias, Jim Morris, David Frick, and the list goes on and on of folks who came out of IU about that same time, perhaps a little bit before you. No, did no, you, I, did I you know them. any of them oh, in yeah. college? Randy Tobias, I knew. David Frick, I knew. Uh, uh, Jim Kittle, I didn't know. He was a little after me. He'd want me to say that. Uh, so you'd Ed know Tracy that. also came through. Yeah, and I didn't know Ed. But I was in student government uh, it, it, during my IU years. Women didn't hold the stature or prestige that the men did. Uh, I think we could all stipulate to that. Uh, but paths crossed during those years. And interestingly, Ken Barker... I was just going to ask this question. Yeah. So you Ken go Barker ahead. was in student government, mm-hmm. and he was closer friends with most of those people. He knew Dave Frick. Not David and his wife, Anne, are really good friends of ours now. Uh, Randy Tobias is a dear friend. Um, so those friendships were formed there. Rex Joseph, do you remember Rex? Mm -hmm. Uh, He was uh, in that group too. Did your husband go to law school with David Frick? Yes. David Frick's been on the podcast. And of all the folks who have come on, it would probably be fair to say he was the least known. Our our tech guru, Chris Bangle. He would be so happy to hear that. He would be happy. He would be. That is his way. He's a very quiet force for good. And the people who listen to it have sent me texts going, My God, I had no idea what this man did for the city. And I think he's the single most important person in in modern Indianapolis who most people have never heard of. You know, he was the first winner of the Whistler Award. Did you know that? Oh, that's right. For Gypsy. Yeah. Way back when, when they were putting together the the makings of this modern city. He's an incredibly self-effacing, humble... Modest guy. Incredibly brilliant man. Mm -hmm. Mark Miles told me, no David Frick, no Indianapolis Colts. Mm -hmm. The fact that David Frick went to Harvard when he was up against or negotiating with the lawyers from the East Coast and the Baltimore Colts, that they they took Frick seriously because he went to Harvard. Like, he's one of us. We can deal with this guy, even though we're only talking about Indianapolis of the early 80s. Uh, one last question I want to ask you as I was perusing through your antechamber and walking around here in your office is you have tons of pictures of folks uh, you're with and then just pictures. And of all of them, and when I say pictures of people, I'm saying President Obama, 
president. They're not, not mugshots. Yeah, yeah, they're not the post. Not, those, that's right. those are one story down yeah, yeah. <laughs> by the entryway. President Bush, President Obama, uh, many Supreme Court justices and other elected officials. But one stood out, and that was obviously uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. How did you feel when President Reagan nominated her? How well did you know her? And what do you think her appointment meant to women in the law and of the law? Well, it was one of those singular moments. Uh, I was U.S. attorney when she became a member of the Supreme Court. I think I have those years right. Do you remember? Do you remember the precise year? Anyway, there was, uh, there was the coincidence of her selection and my having recently become I, – so I could have been a judge – I, maybe I was already on the court, but they happened in close succession. So the question I was being asked at the time was just that question. How do you feel about the selection of Sandra Day O'Connor for the Supreme Court? And of course, I was thrilled. We were all thrilled. The, the, first of all, it was a huge, hugely important symbolic choice. But she was altogether... Uh, well qualified and able, she she was a good representation, an excellent representation of what you get when you appoint the right woman to a position. So, women generally, and this woman in particular, were thrilled by it. So shortly after that, and you know, she was on the court, and I learned that uh, she had started an aerobics class. Do you remember this story? She had an aerobics class. She was the only woman on the court. She got all the law clerks, such as they were, uh, I mean, in terms of numbers, and staff and so forth, and said, we're going to have an aerobics class. So uh, I think they had it up in the gym. You know, they have that third floor, uh, fifth floor, sixth floor gym, whatever it is at the Supreme Court. And uh, I also had always heard that uh, she very much – I enjoyed and took pride in and tended her relationships with women, that she regarded those as valuable to her. So the Seventh Circuit Judicial Conference was going to convene in Indianapolis uh, that May. We always have a May meeting, and we share it with the other states in our circuit. And this was Indianapolis's term, right after she was appointed, and she was invited out as the special speaker. So I called the other women judges in the Seventh Circuit. Uh, There were uh, three of us, one in each state. And I called the other two, and I said, how about if I get in touch with her office and see if she would like to have an opportunity to meet with us? Because I heard that she is interested in other women judges and so forth. If it doesn't pan out, you know, what's the harm in asking? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. So I called out and I laid it out to uh, Justice O'Connor's secretary. And I said, I don't mean this in any way to be impertinent or intrusive if it's it's not appropriate. You just tell me. But here's what I thought. And um, I think maybe we had four women judges. There were two in Chicago at the time. One in Wisconsin, me in Indiana, and two in Chicago. That we would very much enjoy making the, the acquaintance of Justice O'Connor, if she can work it into the schedule and she would like to do it and it's not an inconvenience, blah, blah, blah. So her secretary says, let me run this by her and I'll get back to you. So I'm working around here in chambers one day and my assistant, my judicial assistant, answers the phone and comes hustling down. I was talking to my clerks. It's Justice O'Connor on the phone. I said, herself? And she says, yes. I said, oh. Okay. So I ran to my desk and Justice O'Connor says, Sarah, I got your invitation. What a great idea. Let's do that. Now, here's who's going to put together the schedule, but let's figure out a way to do this. So that was my green light. And it was like a girlfriend calling, Sarah. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yes, let's have a party. <laughs> so uh, we found a, a, a slice of time late in the day during the conference. And her husband, dear John, who, you know, has gone on now, um, was with her. And I made arrangements with Jim Donatio. Remember of Ice Miller, yeah. Donatio, and Ryan, Ryan. who, uh, of course, had a charter membership in the Skyline Club. And I thought that would be the place to take her because she could see out over the city. And get a sense of it, and we could 
uh, it was afternoon. We all drank Cokes or iced tea or something. Truly, believe me, under oath, I would say the same. <laughs> uh, but the marshals walked her over. It was just moving from the Hyatt to the skyline. Uh, and they walked her over and John, too. And we had an hour. And it was just as warm and friendly and cordial as you would want it to be. It was just lovely. And uh, then, you know, in years after that, I was on the Judicial Conference uh, of the United States. And I, so I was out at the Supreme Court for various affairs, and they would come to the receptions almost every single time. Justice O'Connor and I would catch each other's eyes across the room, and we'd make our way. I didn't want to intrude too much, but she would, she would come to me. Hi, Sarah. How's everything in Indianapolis? So it turned out to be something that was a bond between us. And did you do I miss call her? her? Justice. O'Connor? Oh, of course I did. Mm-hmm. Did I miss her? Do I miss her now? Yes, I do. Yeah. The um, I've I've read her books. I listened to her autobiography as a book on tape that she read. I felt like I carpooled with her. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, we always end the podcast with the same five questions. Okay. Yep. And uh, we are going to let the CEO of Girl Scouts of Central Indiana ask the questions this time. Danielle, please go ahead. Well, thanks. All and right. I will say this. Judge O'Connor was a Girl Scout. And yes. so did you and she share that in common? Yes. No, actually, see, now I moved to the country. Okay. I started out as a bluebird and a campfire girl, which was what our school had. And then there were no Girl Scouts. It's, it's a, I, was a, I was a pre-Title IX girl too and I was my statuesque five feet eight inches in height when I was in junior high school and I could play the boys in basketball to a point where they would drop but I had no place to play there were no teams I couldn't practice with the boys that was unseemly well seems like we should change that you should become an honorary girl scout at some point I think I should I think you should okay the five questions sorry Robert what was your first job a babysitting Perfect. What was your first concert? Uh, well, I, you know, I was in the choirs in junior high school, in church, and when I was, you know, just a little kid. No, we're thinking like Led Zeppelin. Oh. Elvis. Uh, well, I did play the guitar, you know. <laughs> now, who did you go see in concert? Oh, who, who did I go first? see? I thought you meant when did I perform? No. You know, I'm Strawberry a per- alarm clock. I'm a we're performer. We're thinking about who you saw. <laughs> Boy, that's a hard one. Um Oh, well, John Denver was one of them, and it was in D.C. Because right, I was coming up in the thick of the folk music, yeah. uh, right. Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, all of those. John Denver is excellent. That's a yeah. good one. Yeah. Has anybody said that one before? Someone has said okay. John Denver Oh, before. yeah. Was, if they're of my era, they probably did. I met him, at, I met him personally at the cellar door in, oh. in Georgetown because he used to work the crowd. He'd come out and talk to the people in line coming in for, this, for the late show. Hmm. So you might ask why a nice young girl like me was out so late, but I wish you wouldn't ask me that. It's one of your five questions. That we won't. <laughs> question you number six. The door, right? yeah. <laughs> okay, the third question. If you could suggest a book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? Hmm. Well, a recent book would be All the Light We Cannot See, which is an ex- extraordinarily fine book. Um, but I have many favorite authors that's a hard question uh, the um I, I i i it's very hard for me to choose one that's okay mm-hmm. all right if you could witness any event in history be there in person as it happened which event would you choose well i don't know about events but i sure would have liked having dinner with eleanor roosevelt um would you want to be there for the Marian Anderson concert at? Oh, well, that's yes, of course that was, Lincoln Memorial. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful um, suggestion. I uh, the great moments in history are are tricky because the ones that turn out to be greatest in your own personal history are small moments, and uh, they only matter really sort of to you or your family or whatever. Um, the um, I would have liked to have been there when Sandra Day O'Connor was sworn in. And the last question. If you could have dinner 
with anyone living today living. for two hours off the record, just chat. Who would you like to have dinner with? With Rachel Maddow. I think she's top of the heap. All right. Thank you so much. The Indiana Historical Society, as I mentioned at the beginning, has a, a initiative, a program called Living Legends. And we've had several of those Living Legends appear on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Mark Miles, Allison Melangdon, Mitch Daniels. Uh, Judge Barker is one of those Living Legends. And of all the ceremonies for induction I've attended... The one that she served as master of ceremonies for was by far the funniest. (laughs) And the reception she got from her fellow Hoosiers tells you a lot. It's very few people who can handle jobs with such immense prestige and immense responsibility while maintaining a smile and a crackerjack sense of humor. And Judge Barker does it. And we could not be more honored to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to have been included. And it's been fun to banter back and forth with you today. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com.